also I don't want to I don't want to not mention Israel um, again. Just the 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 more things that we hear coming out of the the country over there, the worse it seems. Like it's just horrible atrocities being committed over there, and uh, we want to keep Israel in prayer, and we want to uh, pray for God's presence over there in a real way. We want to pray for repentance of the the people who are committing these acts, and we also want to pray for justice. Um, And I think it's right. I think it's right to want justice in a situation like that. It's right to have a righteous anger, to see these things and and to feel that way. Um, So let's go ahead and uh, go to our Father in prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are a good God who hears prayer, Lord. Uh, We we thank you for... um, for the building we have, again, Jesus, thank you that we're here. We're able to gather like this, Lord. Uh, we, we pray for Jenny, God, that you would just bring healing to her, that you would reduce this swelling and, and let her know that you're there with her, Jesus. Um, we pray for Robin. We ask that, that you would heal the sickness in her father and that you would just uh, lift up her spirits and help her to be feeling better. Uh, we come to you today for Israel, Jesus, and ask that your hand would move there in a mighty way, Lord, that there would be divine intervention there. And uh, while they're on the world stages, they always seem to be that um, you would glorify your name in a really big way, Father, that, that people could would look and would just have to see that you are moving there, Lord. Uh, we pray for salvations through this, this horrible thing that's happened in God. You are a God who takes bad things like this and, and works them for good. It's what you do. And uh, so we pray that you would do that in this situation. Um, pray as we get into your word today that you would, you would let it speak to us, that you would, you would let it weigh on our hearts in the right way, the way it needs to, Father, that you would encourage us also. Um, we thank you and we praise you, Lord. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Uh, so today we are going to be in John chapter 17. John chapter 17. So has anybody ever been to a foreign country? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, lots of people. Um, Sarah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> um, they do things totally different in different places. Um, country across the pond, England, a little bit different. Um, they drink tea more than coffee over there, which is crazy to me. Uh, they buy milk in bags. You know, I'm really holding back from saying a joke about well, they can take their tea out of the Boston Harbor, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna refrain. They drive on the wrong side of the street. They buy milk in bags over there. You shouldn't be buying milk in bags. I think any country should think about that. Like that's what happened to England. If y'all mess with the U.S., you guys are gonna be buying milk in bags. Uh, different countries all have different customs, though. In in Malaysia, they consider it rude to point with their index finger, and they point with their thumbs. In Nicaragua, they point with their lips. Greeks, get this, Greeks associate spitting with good luck, and they may even spit on the bride on her wedding day. Could you imagine? Could you imagine if it was like Bridezilla? And she was, like, horrible the whole time, and the brides were like, you just wait until your wedding day. Like, they're saving something for them. <laughs> Danish people, they convert cemeteries into, into parks, and they actually hang out in them, tombstones and all. This one got me. Uh, in Japan, slurping noodles is a sign that you are enjoying them. I, I, I think I'd rather get spit on than hang out in a room full of people slurping noodles. I, just, I, I don't know if I could deal with it, man. Just thinking about it right now is making my skin crawl. Like, I need to go back into prayer again almost. Um, but uh, all these things are so much different than the way we do things here, right? It, I would imagine that, that if you were, you were visiting another country, all of these things would kind of make you feel a little bit farther away from home. And it would amplify the fact that you're a stranger in a foreign land. 
people in Nicaragua, if they came over here, though, it'd be the same thing. They would think that, that we were rude for not pointing with our thumbs. People in England, if they came over here, with, they would see the things that normal people do because we drive on the right side of the road. And they might have to take some of that home with them. I don't know. But seriously, it's, it's easy to feel like a stranger in a foreign land when you're away from home. And uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Feeling like strangers in a foreign land. Like being away from home. Not being the way that it's supposed to be. Um, John 17, 13 to 19. But now I'm coming to you with these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. So this is what's known as the high priestly prayer. Um, It's the last thing Jesus did before he was taken away to be crucified or to be tried and crucified. And it always gets to me because he could have prayed for anything at this moment. And he prayed for us. Like his prayer wasn't to take pain away. It wasn't for courage. It was for us. During this prayer, though, he says that the disciples are not of the world. And we're going to get into that today, what he meant when he said that. So, so we know the story, right? God created the heavens and the earth, paradise. God created Adam and Eve, and they walk with God. Man and woman walking with God in a perfect world away from the disease of sin. And God gives them free reign to rule over the earth, but he gives them one rule, one choice. Don't eat from one certain tree. And they are tempted by the serpent. They rebel against God. Sin enters the world and is passed down through them. Now, sin has caused a separation between us and God, and sin has now tainted every bit of creation and is everywhere you look. Um, You know, it's... uh, kind of crazy to me. We were talking this morning um, about the, the Pacific Northwest and the Grand Canyon and, and New Mexico and all these kind of things. And these things, like, they kind of take our breath away when we see them, right? The crazy thing is they're not what they should be. They're not even as beautiful as they should be. And it just, it kind of, it, when you think about that, it gives you a, a different look on what heaven will actually look like? I mean, if it looks that awe-inspiring now in a fallen world, what's it going to look like when we're not, right? So we had paradise with God. Now we have a fallen creation without him. And this is evident in the world around us, right? It just seems to be getting worse. Like we're used to living in a world with, with sin and wars, but now the way of the world is just getting straight up confusing. The landscape of culture is changing so fast, and it seems that the world is looking at what the Bible teaches is right and the true way that God has called us to live and doing the exact opposite of that. So for Christians, this can be a really hard reality because not only are we trying to walk faithfully with the Lord in a way that honors God, but we're doing so in a world that is increasingly hostile to it. And it can feel like like we're alone, like strangers in a foreign land. And while while we should never doubt that, that this is where we're supposed to be right now, that God has us right where he wants, wants us to be, right at the time he wants us to be there, I think it's important to remember that this world and its culture is not our home. We're called to a different kingdom. And because of that, I don't think feeling out of place in today's culture is a bad thing. In fact, I think it points to us being on the right track. So so think of it like this. The world is under control of Satan, right? 
And I don't mean that he has absolute power. That belongs to, to God alone. Only God is sovereign, omnipresent, and omnipotent. And remember that, because I think sometimes we give too much credit to demonic forces in the world. But we also need to be mindful that there is power that the enemy does have. And his power influences and controls the world. And what I mean by that is the enemy influences and controls the system of the world or the way that it operates. Uh, 1 John 5, 19 says, we know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. I mean, look around. It's obvious that the world is not following God. The worst parts of humanity are broadcasted online for entertainment. The world is filled with theft and murder, terror plots, wars, rape, child trafficking, abortion. What's more is the world is believing the lie as Satan leads them to believe that wrong is right and right is wrong. Killing a child in the womb is actually about having freedom and not the murder of an infant. Following what, what God's word says about marriage being between one man and one woman no matter how much love we have when we say it, is now considered hate speech. And on top of all that, people are committing horrible acts and claiming they're acting on God's behalf. Israel is a prime example of this right now. There have been horrible, horrible atrocities committed this week. And, and people have been claiming they're acting on, on God's behalf. Children killed, innocent women raped and murdered in their homes, all while people were shouting glory to God. And while this should drive us to our knees in prayer, it shouldn't surprise us because Jesus told us this was going to happen. John 16, 1 to 2 says, I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. You know, it says put you out of the synagogues. You know what's sitting in the Temple Mount right now? It's something called the Dome of the Rock. So where the actual temple of God was, the synagogues were in the temple. And Jerusalem is now Dome of the Rock. So they have actually put people out of the Temple Mount. And it says whoever kills you would think he's offering service to God. That's kind of like somebody shouting glory to God as they kill people thinking that they're, they're in doing so in the name of God. So while I believe that we need to act in the face of evil and that we absolutely need to call out sin for what it is, my point here isn't to rail against any kind of people group. Um, the Bible is clear that the battle isn't with them. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. My point here with this is this, to encourage you. And it's encouraging because the word tells us that the world is going to look this way right now. That's the whole point of Jesus telling us about this, to keep us from falling away. Could you imagine if the Bible didn't tell us that the world is going to be a mess? It'd be kind of scary, right? Like we'd look out and be like, what in the world is going on? Maybe make us doubt our faith and walk away. But Jesus wants us to know to expect this. So that we're not prepared, unprepared to live out our faith in the world. You know, I hear this argument, or not argument, but I hear, I hear this all the time from well-meaning people. But they say that, that when you become a Christian, your life gets like so much easier, that if you just accept Jesus into your life, it's all sunshine and rainbows, and that you'll never have any trouble again. And I'm just like, seriously, bro? <laughs> like, we're going to go over, over this more next week. But uh, John 16, says, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And I can go through verse after verse after verse of God saying, you are going to go through stuff. It's going to happen. 
He doesn't say we're not going to. He says that he'll be with us when we do. That's the promise, is that he is with us. And I mean, don't get me wrong on this. When, when you meet Jesus and start walking with him, life gets exponentially better. It does. You have peace. You have love. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. You have God forever. A true abundant life is one that is walked with Jesus. You can't get it anywhere else. But living for Jesus is in a whole lot of ways harder than living for yourself. So let me explain, explain what I mean. Before I was saved, there were a lot of things I didn't care about. And I'm, and I'm talking before the drugs and the addiction. Before that, even before that. I mean, during drugs and addiction, it just got amplified. But before that, there were just things I didn't, didn't even care about because I wasn't living for God. Um, white lies, dishonesty, if it didn't hurt anybody and nobody knew about it, why would it be such a big deal? Did, did it matter? Right? Now it's different. I'm held to my integrity by a God who sees and knows and expects a certain standard from me. Lust, before I was, if I, if I checked out another girl on the side of the road and it didn't hurt anybody, it wouldn't have mattered, right? Jenny didn't care. Jenny would always say, like, you're going home with me, I don't care. So she wouldn't even care about me checking out other girls on the side of the street. But now, totally different. God expects something more from me. God expects me to be a husband that honors my wife, right? And holds a higher standard. He's holding me to a higher standard than the world that doesn't follow him. And he, he says, and we're going to get into this in the beginning of the year. We're going to go over, we're going to start a sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. But then we're going to get into it more there. But he says that even lusting in my heart is like committing adultery. So, I mean, by the world standards, that's unachievable, right? Which is kind of what he was getting at when he said, <laughs> when he said it. Anger. You know, I use, I use this illustration all the time because there's nowhere that can make us more angry than in traffic sometimes, right? And, and before, if someone cut me off, you know, I would maybe fly around them and throw up like three fingers for Dale Earnhardt or do like a, a shake and bake Ricky Bobby sign as I drove by him. But uh, now I know that he has called me to be somebody who, who has self-control. I'm not saying that, that you have to know Jesus to have these, but this is the standard that, that he, he calls us to. And what about, what about um, selflessness? Before it was all about about me and what made me happy. And now I'm called to put other people ahead of myself. And it was easier in a certain way because I, I simply didn't care about those things or found ways to, to justify them. But now the Holy Spirit lives inside of me and I go to war with the flesh every day because I'm his. But the hardest part of it is, is that while I'm battling against sin in my life, the world is trying to tell me that that sin is okay. So let's get real about it for a second. Social media, news, like these in and of themselves, depending on how they are used, are not inherently bad. But having them in front of you for six hours a day is not good for you or for your soul. You're not made to have the horrors of the world and the news force-fed into your brain throughout the entire day. And it can be horrible for your mental health in the way that you think. I've, I've discovered that a lot lately. I can't get through a football game without hearing about Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift dating. I'm serious. Like, I'm struggling with it, y'all. Like, I'm, I'm just, I, I don't care. Like, I don't care. And I've, I've made it a big deal in the house. Like, me and Jenny will be talking, and they'll, they'll show Taylor Swift cheering on at the game. And I'll, and I'll be like, stop, babe. 
I got to watch. They're showing Taylor Swift. Like, I just make a big deal about it because it's so ridiculous to me. Like, she'll write a song about him here next year when he's her ex. Two ways to get a song written about you. Slay a dragon, break up with Taylor Swift. One of the two. I'm just saying. It's not in the notes. You guys can have that one for free. <laughs> but the, it can be horrible for our mental health, right? It, especially when, when we're not made for the world, but for the kingdom of God. So I've got to ask you a question. How much of the world do you get? And how much of the word do you get every day? Do you have more of the world than the word? Think about this. If you start an all junk food diet, how are you going to feel? Not going to feel very well, right? And it's the same way when you get all that the world feeds you constantly. Your mind isn't going to feel that well. And what's going to happen is you're going to be influenced by one of two things. Either the word or the world. And it's whatever you are taking in more. The Bible warns us about this and gives us instructions. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So get into the word, his good, perfect, and true word, and be intentional about it. Make it a point to set aside time to start the day with the Lord and renew your mind before the day even starts. And then come to church. Come to church. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25 says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. I was reading today, um, this morning in, in the word in, in Timothy, uh, Paul was talking about how he had expelled somebody from the church, left, let them over to Satan. And uh, it struck me because there's this whole process you go through with church discipline where it's, it's, you talk to them and, and you go through a whole process about it before you get to that point. But the whole point of Paul doing this wasn't punishment, but it was to bring them to repentance. And, and it really made me think in light of today's message, I was sitting there thinking about it, was he's letting them over to Satan, take, kicking them out of the church pretty much to give them over to Satan. So what does that mean? that Satan's power and influence isn't near as heavy on them when they are around a community of believers that are there encouraging and, and lifting each other up. And he was kicking them out where Satan is going to, pretty much what he's saying is they're going to be brought low and they're going to come crawling back to the church in repentance. So how much stronger are we when we're together, right? I mean, if, if being away from the church brings you to that, then that should tell us that we need to be in, involved in people. You know, and I know I know that going to church and and reading the Bible are things that sound old school that you just hear it so much. But there's a reason that it has been talked about for so long. It's because it's true. It helps. It does stuff. It it helps us to live. So, come to church. Come to the chosen Bible study to breaking bread. Um, to Tuesday Bible study. We, uh, this past Tuesday, we were there and we were getting into it how, <laughs> I'm going to say it, how we, uh, we need each other. Like sometimes people plant seeds and other times people water plants. And we were joking about how bad it is that people, like if we sit, sit here and say, well, I need to water you, I need to be watered. That just sounds bad, right? Like somebody came up to me and said, hey, let me water you. Like, what did you just say to me? <laughs> but seriously, be watered. We need it. The Christian life is meant to be lived with others. We're meant to, to encourage, lift up, sometimes call out one another in sin. And that's the way God intended it to be. Uh, next week is part two of this message. And we're going to go over how we're meant not just to protect ourselves from influence, but we're meant to influence the culture, to go out and push out against the darkness, not just be on the the defensive, but the offensive. Um, but today, to sum up the sermon, if you guys want to want to come up, um, today to sum up the sermon, the world is opposed to the way Jesus calls us to live. 
Uh, it's under the influence of the enemy, and the enemy in the world tries to influence us. But through, through his word and gathering, we can move forward in the way that God has called us to, to move. Um, at this time, what I'm going to do is we want to take a love offering for our missionary, um, Sarah, that has come in today. Uh, we want to come up alongside of her and support her as she goes to change the culture in Laos for, for Jesus, to see what, to, to show them over there what Jesus can do. We know it. We want other people to see it too. So we're going to take a love offering at this time. Um, we'll go ahead and take that while, uh, while they're playing, and then we'll, we'll go ahead and pray together and be dismissed afterwards. You guys go ahead and stand um, with me. We're going to pray and then uh, be dismissed. Um, man, give it up for Michaela and Shane. They just... Such a blessing to us. Such a blessing to us. Um, Father, thank you. Thank you for, for your goodness to us. Thank you that you have called us to walk a different way. Way where we can have a true abundant life and that's following you and thank you for that Jesus help us Father help us as we go out into the world help us to be bold in our faith Lord help us to be so on fire for you Lord that the world is influenced through us and not the other way around Lord Jesus Help us wherever we go, whether it's at, at home, at school, at work, to live in a way that honors you. It's tough, God. It is tough. But uh, we know with you inside of us and by our side, we can do what you have called us to. We thank you for that. Pray for Michaela and, and Shane as they, they go back home, Father, when, when they go back home, that you would just guide them, protect them, keep them safe. Jesus, I pray.
pray for my brothers and sisters here today uh, that you would protect them, keep them safe throughout the week, Lord. That your blessings would be upon them and that you would open their eyes to see those blessings, Father. We pray all this in, in your name, Jesus. Amen. Love you guys.